Vermont State House, completed in 1859, is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to resolving the state's problems, issues, and opportunities. Here is where everyone from the lawmakers and lobbyists to ordinary citizens come to meet and urge policy initiatives of one sort or another. You just walk in and head for your destination. It's a remarkably open building. For many, the first stop of interest might be the large room where the House of Representatives meets on the second floor of the three-story building. This day, lawmakers are on the floor hearing about a group of new bills being introduced that they will eventually discuss in their committee rooms. A short distance away is the governor's ceremonial office, where press conferences are held and other announcements are made. It's a crossroads for the state's top officials and the media that cover them. Next door is the Cedar Creek Room, which commemorates a battle in the Civil War where Vermonters played a prominent role. It's often the setting for special interest groups who have come to the State House to try to influence legislation. Today, a group of supporters of Black Lives Matter have gathered to promote their cause. And beyond that lies a room which is seldom unoccupied, the cafeteria. It's here that we caught up with Brian Keefe, a newly elected representative from the district that includes Manchester, Arlington, Sunderland, and Sandgate, who gave us his take on how things were going during our visit a few weeks into the start of the current session. Well, I'm on the Human Services Committee, so we deal a lot with the Agency of Human Services. So a lot of the programs that are uh, managed by United Counseling Service, for example, come into play. A lot of very important human service challenges, whether it's uh, food or uh, housing, you know, homelessness, child custody, foster care, uh, and also uh, opiates, the drug crisis. I think that I think the statewide uh, challenge to address the increasing use of misuse of drugs, and heroin in particular, uh, is something that uh, is of grave concern. There's some there's some progress being made on it, but there's some budget challenges that go along with the program changes. So I was wondering, is it hard to stay in touch with the folks back in Manchester and Arlington, Sunderland, Sandgate, uh, or, or how does the communication go back and forth? Yeah, yeah. So we're up here during the week, obviously, and on, on weekends I'm back in Manchester. And uh, last Monday I made the rounds to the town clerk's offices, for example. I went to its four town clerk's offices to chat with them briefly about uh, things that are going on, but also we had a, an election challenge that was coming up the following week, so I wanted to get a little impact uh, input, I should say, from the town clerk about uh, what they were hearing about that uh, recount challenge and, and how it is typically handled in their jurisdictions. Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit of both getting back there on the weekends and I see people up here uh, into the, in the state house quite often as well. We've had uh, folks from the Vermont Veterans Home was, were here a couple days ago for a reception and I've seen some Burn Burton people and uh, and then there's always email and snail mail and everything else. So uh, there's plenty of ways to contact me to find me if you're looking for me. And I encourage people to do that because I like to hear from people and try to find solutions to real problems. A short distance from the cafeteria are some of the committee rooms where legislators hear from advocates and policy experts as they craft new legislation. One of the new members of the Ways and Means Committee is Cynthia Browning, who represents the same district with Brian Keefe. Today, they are hearing about some of the issues raised by Governor Scott's budget proposal, which seeks to hold the line on state spending and not increase taxes or fees. At one point, Browning steps out of the committee room to confer with Steve Klein of the Joint Fiscal Office, which crunches the numbers for lawmakers and assesses the financial impact of proposed taxes and spending. A little later, Representative Browning met us on the floor of the House chamber, where she assessed the start of this year's session. 
Well, I think there's uh, two things that come to mind. One was what's called the budget adjustment. We are now halfway through the state's fiscal year. And so, you know, whenever you lay out a budget, you have to adjust it during the year. So we had the budget adjustment, and it included um, money for the veterans' home and money for, um, I think, the PFOA dealing with the PFO WEG contamination. Of course, that's not Manchester and Arlington, but it's still mm -hmm. Bennington County, and you know we're all in this together. What happens to property taxes is not just related to what school boards vote, because the state has systematically put so much stuff in the end fund that school boards do not control. All right, school boards control most of it, but there's like 200, 250 million that is controlled by the state. So if the state says, oh, you school boards, you should be, well, you know, the state is part of this problem. So those would be the two points that I made. And and those would be the two bills that I think were most relevant for us. I just wondering, have the dynamics of the legislature changed at all with the new governor and yeah, the new so. speaker? Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting because all of the leaders are, are new. They're not new to the building. They've been in various roles before, but they're they're new to their current roles. And so it does seem different. I think that um, the people in the House and Senate leadership were not in leadership when Governor Douglas was here. So I think they're going to need to figure out how do you deal with a governor of another party um, and what kind of strategic moves and strategic considerations and all that dance of deal making, which gets a little tedious at times. I like to just like, this is where it is. Let's figure out a place in the center to meet. You know, that's what I like to do. So I think there's a certain, uh, there's a learning curve. And I even think there's a learning curve for the governor's office because his budget proposal, um, while it was effective in advancing certain ideas, is um, actually unworkable and impractical. And from my perspective as an economist, in some ways, made no sense. So, you know, I'm willing to look at certain parts of it, but he put out there, I'm um, freezing state spending, and but he didn't. He increased state spending. He just moved it into the ad fund. So, you know, I'm like, you know, don't do that. You know, that's not, that's disingenuous. That's not, that's not good. So I think he needs to get his game up too. But for me, and I say this at the risk of offending people, but I just, since you asked, I have to say that as many people may know, I had a lot of disagreements with former Governor Shumlin and also the former Speaker of the House, Schaaf. So the fact that they have both moved on and I am still here is really nice. <laughs> and I'm extremely grateful to the current House leadership for assigning me to, assigning me to House Ways and Means. I'm going to do my best to bring my skills to bear on all those important and taxing issues. So I'm really excited. Across the hall from where the Ways and Means Committee meets is the Commerce Committee meeting room, which is chaired by Representative Bill Botso of Pownall and Woodford. A new member of this committee is Linda Joy Sullivan, who won election this past November to represent Dorset, Danby, Mount Tabor, Peru, and Landgrove. Today, her committee is hearing from the Young Professionals of Rutland, part of a process of drafting a bill aimed at boosting the state's economic activity. To me, as someone who wants to build their career here in Vermont, um, and so I'm very excited to share with you a little bit about uh, what Rutland Young Professionals is, a little bit about how we got started, and some of the activities that we're doing to try to address some of the uh, barriers that we've identified for young professionals who want to come and make a life here in Vermont. We asked Representative Sullivan if the lawmaking process and experience had turned out to be what she expected. A blend. It's definitely been a blend. The uh, people are totally engaged, which is what I was hoping for. I believe that everybody comes with their own passions. I believe that I came here truly believing my promise to speak with my constituents. And when I did come up here, I felt that I needed to go back to Dorset and set up those business hours because I felt that you could really distance yourself because you get caught up in what's happening within the entire state and it's much more important to come back and re-engage and bring the news back. So for me, that was the surprise. I was not expecting the distance to mean so much. But all in, I think staying connected with the constituents is the key. 
and sharing their viewpoints on what the different bills are that are going around and how it would affect our district specifically is important. Some of the bills that we hear through Commerce affect the state at the top level. So we may hear insurance bills that will affect the state, but then there's a flow down of the way, um, say, the Uber comes in and may drive some um, work opportunities to our locals, as well as some uh, captive insurance that's coming in and setting up corporations. So people are not as aware of the regulatory side and how it actually does flow down from a commerce standpoint. We are definitely going to be talking about the um, benefits cliff, which I'm passionate about. <laughs> and so there are some bills that will be hitting us this week, actually. They just kind of signed to us today and yesterday. And so we'll be talking about that. And I think workforce development and what's going on in Rutland, because we're so close to Rutland, um, and the young people who are developing small businesses there and how it will flow into Bennington is very important. Um, we do get bills, once again, that start top heavy across the state because it's regulatory and it's the finance departments that regulate them. But then in the end, the flow down of developing small corporations and redefining the definitions of what a small corporation is is crucial for the entrepreneurial spirit that's within our district because most of the corporations shy of travel and entertainment will be 25 people or less. So when like a law firm may come in, it's going to be a few partners and so so a lot of the bills of my committee have redefined these definitions. On the other end of the building, also on the second floor, is the state senate chamber, where 30 lawmakers who are elected by county meet and deliberate. But again, like in the House, senators spend sizable amounts of time in their committee rooms. We talked with Senator Dick Sears of Bennington in the room where his Judiciary Committee meets. Sears is the chairman of that committee. At the time of our visit, the size of the state budget was a big preoccupation for a lot of lawmakers. It was projected to be in the 50 to $70 million range back last February. That has since been whittled down considerably to under $10 million. There's a lot of bills that I'm dealing with, and uh, I'm really involved in also the budget, which uh, is a huge problem this year. The governor's budget is short by about somewhere in the 50 to 75,000, 75 million dollar range. His plan for education, shifting the teacher's retirement, higher education and early education into the education fund um, and balancing the budget that way isn't realistic because he was counting on certain things happening that probably aren't going to happen, which would be the level funding of all school budgets in the state. School district every the state. school district would be level funded, and every school district would, to accomplish $15 million in savings, teachers would be paying more in, for health care. Um, and that doesn't seem to be something that can get done. There's a lot of opposition to it, but even if you're for it, to get that to happen, to have every school district in the state level fund their budget, it's quite a, a challenge, uh, unless you're mandating it. And we are, and he, uh, his bill does mandate that they are level funded, but I don't see the legislature passing that mandate. It's kind of a standoff right yeah. now. The, the uh, bill on, um, a decision that has left many mental health centers and many community mental health programs um, up in arms had to do with when is the duty to warn and it was a decision of the Vermont Supreme Court and it was a three to two decision and the dissent from Justice Reimer and Justice Scoglin indicated a new duty to warn which has created a backup in our exasperated a backup in our mental health institutions, our hospitals, uh, psychiatric hospitals, and so forth, because people worried about this duty to warn about something that might happen and being liable for it. So we're trying to deal with that. We're dealing with corrections issues, mental health and corrections, um, dealing with uh, a variety of issues. <laughs> 
Not far away sits the Senate Committee Room on Natural Resources and Energy, where we caught up with Bennington County's other senator, Brian Campion. He is the vice chairman of this committee, which has been deeply involved in the PFOA problems found in North Bennington and Pownall. The Attorney General's office, they were there updating us around uh, the negotiations with St. Gobain, or as much as they can talk to us. And as you probably heard, we're hoping to hear some kind of information uh, out of these negotiations uh, in weeks rather than months, so hopefully sooner rather than later. It's, um, it's been a long haul for, for folks whose wells have been contaminated with PFOA, a really long haul. You may know uh, that this entire committee, Senate Natural Resources and Energy, uh, went down to actually meet with residents, I think it was just last week, to hear personal stories. And uh, yeah, they're heartbreaking, I mean, without a doubt. You know, folks that you know, raise children with this in their water, people, I remember uh, one woman got up and said, she and her family would fill their water bottles, believing it was the cleanest, best water before going on hikes. And then this news comes out, uh, cooking with it, showering with it, all sorts of activity, uh, human uh, to chemical activity. So, um, and these poet systems uh, are just a temporary solution. What we're trying to do, what we want to do is make certain everybody has a reliable source of clean water going forward. And that's hooking people up to the municipal water system. So um, one of the things that we're trying to do is what S10 does, which is a bill that came out of this committee last week, um, holds polluters, uh, people that are identified by the Secretary of Natural Resources and Energy after a, a, a hearing of sorts, an investigation, holds polluters responsible for um, hooking people up to a permanent water source. Again, in other words, in the case of Bennington, that would be um, a municipal water source. And so that, what people have now is really temporary and it's, um, there are people that also, rightfully so, are concerned about uh, how their filters are working. There's a lack of confidence in those. Um, a lot of people are still drinking bottled water so hopefully we'll get a solution fast and put something in place to make people whole again. And so, and then as I mentioned when you came in, we're, we're looking at how do we prevent this from happening in the future? Uh, and so what sorts of toxins should be on a, on, a, on a watch list? What is out there that may have been used or people might want to use to make certain that um, the right controls and the right safety precautions and the right notifications are in place to avoid uh, basically what just happened to the people of Bennington and North Bennington. The State House is back in session after town meeting break and bills are crossing over from the House to the Senate and vice versa. The next few weeks we'll see a flurry of activity, particularly as the session's end swings into view. For the GNET TV News Project, I'm Andrew McKeever.